Perhaps the Maritime's most unusual example of interior decorative painting is a complete little house that sits inside the art gallery of Nova Scotia. Maud Lewis, a primitive painter from Digby County, seemed to delight in painting on anything and everything. Her house has to be considered one of her greatest works of art. Maud's home was lovingly restored and now sits alongside other great works of art on display at our Provincial Art Gallery. Interior decorative wall painting began some 30,000 years ago with drawings found on the walls of caves in Europe, and later images found in Nova Scotia created by our indigenous people. It reached its height with Michelangelo's frescoes in the Sistine Chapel in Rome, which are among the most famous and exquisite examples of interior wall painting. In Nova Scotia in the late 18th century, it was popular to commission painters and decorators to work on public buildings and occasionally in private homes. Perhaps the most familiar example of interior decorative painting can be seen in the many churches throughout the province. Late in the 1800s and well into the 1900s, there was a tradition in Nova Scotia of itinerant artists. They would travel around painting murals and decorative designs in houses in exchange for room and board. Many of these artists are unknown. Most use oil paint on plaster walls, but here one of the few known artists, Francis Silver from Hansport, Nova Scotia, painted directly on wood paneling. One of the most amazing painted rooms in Canada is the parlor of William Crosscuff's home on the north shore of the Annapolis Basin. It was painted by an unidentified artist between 1846 and 1848. The complete interior of the living room was taken apart. Plaster walls, floor, fireplace, windows, trim and all to Queen's University in Ontario where it was painstakingly restored and the entire room was carefully reassembled and is now on display in the Maritime Gallery of the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa. In the dining room of a house originally owned by a Halifax businessman, an unknown itinerant painter circa 1926 created a series of murals depicting classic scenes from Ireland, the owner's native homeland. Heritage Trust Nova Scotia, under the leadership of Trust member Joyce McCullough, arranged funding to repair and conserve the damaged area of this unusual series of wall paintings. Michelle Gallinger, an experienced conservator, was brought in for the job and over a two-week period we documented her painstaking work to restore and conserve the damaged areas of these murals. P.J. Templeton is with the Halifax Regional Municipality Grants Program, who came up with the funding for the project. Really, we're interested in two aspects of the project. The first is educational, making people aware of the interior decorative arts of heritage places particularly local ones within HRM. But hopefully by this example people will be motivated to preserve things such as uh, interior wood carving, plaster work, trompe this beautiful metal work within these homes. And particularly if these are not public spaces it's very difficult sometimes to gain access. Uh, we're, so we're very privileged to have this opportunity to see this particular feature. The second aspect of interest for us is more along the lines of advocacy. Typically, uh, conventional heritage protection legislation has focused on the exterior of historical homes. We feel that there may be a basis for advocating for some kind of protection to preserve some of these types of interior fixtures. It was called the Turnbull House years ago. There's, there's a mural of Halifax Harbour, there's murals of farmyards and then there's murals of boats 
Um, all the information. It's all behind. The... All behind this wallpaper. This whole room. All four walls, upper and lower, is supposed to be painted. And it is all murals. I can guarantee you, underneath all of the wallpapers, murals. John Slayer. Uh, 1840 some I think he done the paintings here for room and board is what they tell me because this used to be a hotel so we're hoping that this project can serve as an example to others in the general public who may know of some of these examples perhaps are taking them for granted or didn't realize their value and perhaps we can discover more of these this project can serve as an example to create that awareness and hopefully to motivate others to discover those and protect those assets. This particular case we're looking at a painted room and we're learning something of the conservator's craft, the skills and the knowledge that goes into preserving these features. When I first walked into the room here in Halifax um, it was pretty evident about the damage that had occurred in the corner. I was called in by Heritage Trust to consult on the damages that had occurred due to water um, dripping from a second floor bathroom. The process begins with obviously a very close examination of the painting and first what its materials are made of, what its substructure is made of, that is what is the painting actually painted on, its uh, support, and in this case it's plaster with oil paint on the surface. What is interesting about the painting was after further examination um, it, I realized that it actually wasn't the paint layer that was the, was the problem, it was actually the priming layer or the ground that was put underneath. There's a good probability due to the date of circa 1914 that it actually is a lead-based paint. I knew immediately what would work more than likely. Then of course I brought a number of different materials with me, tested them and found that unfortunately some of them that I really would have preferred to have used that would have made the treatment quicker and probably in some ways uh, more successful were not possible. The other things that of course come into play is the fact that I couldn't use chemicals that could be carcinogenic or um, were toxic to the family. It is a wall, you can't take it down. so. Um, you have to work on it in a, in a vertical position, which is not in any sense ideal. And it also is in a corner, which makes it access also a little less ideal. And so I had to take all of those things into consideration before I chose the treatment that I did. Normally, working on a damaged area of painting when you're actually consolidating paint down, you would actually very carefully um, brush around the area to remove any dirt and dust and pollutants and what, so on. Um, in this case, the paint actually was curled almost like a cornflake. So there was no option in being able to brush it because if, if I did, it would actually knock the paint down to the surface. So I had to consolidate it enough onto the surface to be able to go in then afterwards and remove a lot of the dust and actual plaster um, particles off of the surface of the painting. Oh, I'm just gluing the pieces back in place in this. You can see this piece of paint here belongs in this area someplace. As for the glue to glue the paint back to the surface, it's actually gelatin, which is um, a much more refined form of a rabbit skin or a hide glue. Here, and a number of other small pieces of paint and so I'm just trying to restructure them back into place. This one is a conservation glue that remains continuously reversible. It is important to always use reversible materials in conservation so that other conservators down the road know what's been done. After um, the paint was secured to the surface, uh, actual tacking iron was used with silicone mylar which is uh, a transparent kind of plastic with a silicone coating on it. I'm using the heat from the iron. I'm not actually touching the surface of the painting with the iron. I'm touching the surface of the painting with silicone so that the pieces of paint warm up and stick down to the surface so that the little curls go away. It actually flattens out the curl in the paint. 
once it's all glued back down to the surface, um, then I will start the cleaning process. And that requires using, um, testing a number of different cleaning materials, again using things that are not harmful to uh, the family. Normally I, would, I, I start my initial testing of cleaning solutions always with distilled water or with reverse osmosis water. They are the mildest cleaners. There are also solvent-based cleaners that we use on objects that cannot tolerate having moisture in them. I tested three solvents or three actual cleaning solutions, all again non-toxic because of the family, and found one was very successful in particular. The other two were both quite good at what they did, but they tended to blanch the surface a bit of the paint layer. So my concern was that they were actually leaching a bit of the oil out of the paint layer. And this painting is very, very uh, lean in how much oil is actually in the paint layer. The clean air that we've chosen um, after testing both in the darks and in the light colors of the painting was triammonia citrate at about a one and a half percent solution and it seems to be the best choice because after drawing of, after cleaning and then actually rinsing with distilled water, there is a nice sheen on the paint layer, which means that it hasn't leached out any of the oils from the paint layer. So that's the one we've chosen. And it is a rolling of the swab back and forth. It is not rubbing the surface. If I actually rubbed the surface, I would force the dirt further into the paint layer. After cleaning up the surface of the painting, then the painting needs to be rinsed with distilled water or reverse osmosis water to remove any residue chemical off the surface of the painting. Normally a painting would be completely cleaned and an isolating varnish would go on the surface. In this situation we weren't able to do so, so we actually have proceeded with an initial in-painting, which would be almost considered an underpainting. This is to tone in the areas and make the image look complete until we can put an isolating varnish over the surface and do the final in-painting or over-painting. Like I said, this is just the first primary coat that goes on and then later on I come back in and add the details and it will be both my priming isolation layer so that it will always be removable with a different chemical than the actual paint that I'll apply along with it will be different than what the original painting is so it doesn't affect the original painting. That would be the end in, in this case. Uh, just enough to protect the original painting and to allow for future conservation work to proceed if necessary. They can remove my overpainting without actually affecting the original or the varnish surface coating. I guess most people would find that conservation is a very tedious process. Uh, there, is, there is no doubt that it requires a tremendous amount of patience. The, the interesting part about conservation, or one of my favorite parts about it, is that each new job brings in new challenges. So no two objects are the same, which means no two treatments are the same. I love when a job is complete and a client picks up their painting and for the first time sees what their object as it was initially painted or as it was initially made and sees the beauty of the actual brush strokes versus seeing a layer of dirt. and we are hoping that, by example, this may motivate others, whether it be private homeowners or nonprofit groups, to seek out this type of feature and hopefully work towards protecting it. <laughs>